fellow at work, here's what he told me. He goes, I don't need to turn my life over to Christ. He goes, right before I die, all I got to do is say, God, forgive me, and I'll be able to make it to heaven. And by the Holy Spirit, I told him, I said, no, God will not forgive you. And so he, you know, I got his attention. I said, because you're trying to make a fool of God. You think you can trick your way into uh, the kingdom, his kingdom? I said, God is not a man. He knows all things. He knows your heart. Your little piddly prayer won't bring you into his kingdom. So I challenged him. And, uh, you know, I said, now is the time. Now is the day. You know, tomorrow is not promised. And I'm going to finish in verse 8. Give to the Lord the glory to his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to just bring that offering before him. We're going to praise him. We're going to acknowledge him. Father, we pray that you're all... Young man, you can come forward. Father, we just pray right now that this offering would be received. Lord, we just want to bless your name, acknowledge you, give you all the glory. Amen.
can head on back to their class. Pastor Matt. All right. Three and four-year-olds? Three and four-year-olds, yep. Three and four-year-olds going to class. Heading in the right direction. Hallelujah. Father, we come before you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, that's kind of loud, a lot of loud. We bless you, Lord. We honor you. We declare your kingdom is here amongst us. We declare that your word is infallible. Your word, Father, is true in every facet, in every word, every jot, every tittle, Father. So, Lord, we just declare your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, we declare that your government and that your authority, your kingdom, Father, is an everlasting kingdom. It's an everlasting kingdom of your dominion. There will be no end. So, Father, we just declare your lordship and your authority in this house, in our hearts, in this community, in this country, on this planet. You are king of kings and lord of lords. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and all that dwell therein. So, Father, we give it to you. We, we, we just confess. Father, we know it's yours. We confess it and recognize it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Boy, what an awesome thing it is to be in the house of the Lord. I absolutely love it. And I want to just take a minute and say hi to some friends. I know we we got Deirdre Pugh is with us today. So I know many of you remember Deirdre Pugh and Jeremy. And, and of course, Deirdre is with us and her family. And we're just happy. Let's, Let's see. Everybody wave, Deirdre, for those who don't know Deirdre. She was part of this house for decades, years ago, you know, a long time ago. And, and uh, they since moved. But she's been, uh, she's been a dear, dear friend of ours for a long time. So let's see who's here. So Abby is, uh, let's see, Brooke is over here. Leah is over here. And then Maddie is right here. So we've got, and then there's two more who aren't with us. Jeremiah is at home and, and Abby. And they're pulling down the fort, taking care of the dogs, I think, at, at home. So... We just welcome you. It would be remiss for not to welcome Deirdre. So, Father, again, we just bless you and honor you. And, and boy, what a, what a good thing it is to be in the house of the Lord with friends and with family. And, and I'm just so excited. Last week, Pastor George talked about Isaiah 59. I'd like you to turn there to Isaiah chapter 59. So I, was just, just, I was so encouraged by, by what we've been hearing and, and the whole idea of coming together because the only way we're going to be able to face what's in front of us today is if we do it together. Amen? 
I mean, that's so critical and so important that we understand exactly what that means and what that looks like. And Isaiah 59 is, is as good a place as any to start because there's so much in the Scriptures. There's so much in the Bible about what God does for us on our behalf when we come together in unity. You know, the Scripture says how good it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And we know the scriptures and we know how important it is that we are living stones being built together, that we are, we are those that God is building. We know scripture tells us that the gates of hell, Jesus said himself that the gates of hell shall not prevail against his church. The, did you hear me? Jesus said that. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. So it doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter what we see. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter all the stuff that you hear and what's being reported because the end of the matter has already been declared. The end of the matter has already been declared. And even the prophet Isaiah even said that when the enemy comes in like a flood, which says the enemy will come in like a flood. Has anybody felt overwhelmed? So you, all you've got, you can't even turn on, I mean, I'm talking to secular people who won't even turn on the news anymore because it's overwhelming. It's coming in like a flood. But notice what the prophet says. When the enemy comes in like a flood, then the Spirit of the Lord begins to move. The Spirit of the Lord begins to stir. The Spirit of the Lord begins to become active. And that we know the, when we read about the Spirit of the Lord becoming active, things happen, don't they? In Genesis, when the Spirit of the Lord began to move, what happened? He created order out of chaos, did he not? He started creating things that just weren't ever there before. He called those things that are not and made them as though they were. He began to create a completely new and different reality. And that's exactly what Isaiah is saying. The Spirit of the Lord will begin to move. And when the Spirit of the Lord begins to move, because he responds to the enemy's attacks, the enemy is coming in like, a flood and the spirit of the Lord begins to get active and the spirit of the Lord begins to physically move and we can sense it and feel it and see it and smell it and taste it and the spirit begins to move and what happens a standard goes up a standard goes up and immediately puts an end to the things that the enemy is trying to stop and a standard goes up because the Lord will not be mocked the Lord will not allow the enemy to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. Is that true? Is that true? Can I get an amen? Turn with me in your scriptures to Deuteronomy chapter 28. So I'm just going to get started, if that's okay. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 7. I love this. Now, this is a famous portion of Scripture. Here, here we have in Deuteronomy, Moses is laying out the law, what will happen to those. This is the famous Scriptures of blessing, right? We know that you'll be blessed in the fruit in your body, the produce of your ground, the cattle, your flocks. Everything will be blessed, right? And then we get to this point, and I love this point. The Lord, the Lord will cause. Get this. Look at this. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise up against you to be defeated before your face. Now get this, defeated before your very eyes. It's like, it's like the psalmist says, oh, some fall at my right, some fall at my left, I will not be hurt. They're falling right before my very eyes. They're falling before my eyes, and I want you to get this part. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. This is powerful scripture, and this is a powerful metaphor for exactly what the enemy thinks is going on, because the enemy thinks he has a coordinated, organized attack coming in one way. The enemy thinks he's got a strategy, but what will happen, the Spirit of the Lord begins to move. The Spirit of the Lord begins to get the body of Christ, we get the people of, of Christ recognizing what's going on. The Spirit inside of us gets excited, and we start linking arms, arm in arm, standing together. The nation of Israel comes together. They recognize what's going on. The standard is set up by the Spirit of the Lord, and the enemy gets utterly and completely confused and scatters seven ways. He meant to come in this way with a well-organized, coordinated attack, or so he thought, until God shows up. And then when God shows up, all plans are thrown aside. 
When God shows up, the enemy's strategy is completely befuddled. The enemy's strategy completely falls apart. It be completely becomes known to everybody everywhere what's going on, and he can do nothing but scatter in seven different directions. Flees with his tail between his legs, not knowing where he's going or what he's doing. But there are things that we need to do as a body of Christ to get in that position. We need to get ready for that because it is our promise and it is our inheritance. It is our victory is secure. Our victory is secure. We do not need to fear. I know it looks scary. And it's okay to think that it looks scary. But our victory is secure. Our strategy is firm. We have the greatest general leading the army that's ever led any army in the history of the universe. He is the ultimate strategist. Doesn't this, even the scripture testifies that the Holy Spirit is what? Leads and guides in all truth. That's strategy. He leads and guides in all truth. And if we will learn to submit ourselves and hear again the Holy Ghost, he will give us the strategies that we need to be successful in the evil day when the enemy is coming in like a flood. He will give us the strategies by the Spirit of God that set up, that bring up that standard, that puts an end to what the enemy's doing in our lives. Still might be going on all around us, but we cannot be affected. We cannot be affected. In fact, it was prophesied today that that he is the God of the now. And that's one of the things that I think is critically important for us to understand. If, if you look in the scripture, and I won't take time, I've got it written down in my notes, but if you look in the scripture, there is this story that we all know very well when Jesus was in the boat, right? There's two, two kind of different stories with Jesus in storms. And I want to just declare to you what I feel like the Holy Spirit has told me. There. The first story of the storm was when Jesus and the guys were fishing and, and Jesus was sleeping in the front of the boat, right? And the storm was coming, and the disciples started to panic because their boat was flooding. Their boat was flooding. Water was coming into the boat. They began to sing, and these are experienced fishermen, and I don't need to, you know the story. These guys knew what they were doing. They weren't novices out there on the water. And when they started to get anxious and nervous, it was because there was real danger, not perceived danger. There was real danger. And here we have in this story, we have Jesus sleeping in the front of the boat. And I know that you've heard from this pulpit and, and other places, you know, you hear all kinds of stories about how awesome it was that Jesus was able to sleep in the storm. And how, what a miracle. And there's always, you know, we always hear there's two miracles in that parable. The first miracle was Jesus sleeping in the storm. And there are certainly, there are times in our lives when the, when the Lord calls us to be, to be at peace in the midst of the storm. But then there are other times when they woke him up, Jesus speaks to the storm. And there's two miracles there, and there's things for us that we need to learn. Jesus talks time and time again about being able to discern and know the times. Matter of fact, he rags on the Pharisees for it several times. Oh, you can tell when the weather's going to change, and you see the red sky, and you can see the clouds, and you know this, but you can't discern the times that are right in front of you right now. And this is one of those moments, I think, where there are times when, yes, when the world is going crazy around us, and everything seems like we're drowning, that we need to just rest and have peace. And then there are other times when we need to stand up and speak to the storm. There are other times when we need to stand up and speak to the storm and say, peace, be still. And it calms down. What time is that? Where are we at? This is one of those things we need to think about and pray about and discern about. Is it a time to sleep or is it a time to speak to the storm? I heard whispers. Listen, this is a spiritual attack we are facing. This is a spiritual attack. The enemy is trying his darndest to get us flustered, get us scared, to get us nervous, to get us thinking about things that we normally wouldn't think of. He's trying to distract us. He's trying to give us off of our game. And this is the time, I believe, in my spirit, where we need to stand up and speak to the storm. And we stand up and speak to the storm together. We are the body of Christ. We are Jesus' hands and feet. We are the representation of his bodily and earthly form right now. We are it. We are his body. And we need to stand up and speak to the storm. It is on us to do this. 
And it's our authority. Then there's the other storm story, which is also just as interesting a story. As we know that the guys were fishing again, and Jesus is walking on the shore, and Peter sees them across, and, he's, and they get so excited. Peter says, Lord, bid me come unto you. Jesus is walking on the water. Jesus, and so Peter jumps out of the boat, and we know the story. Jesus jumps out of the boat, or Peter jumps out of the boat, and he's walking towards Jesus, and he's, he's walking on the water, and then he gets there, and then he realizes, he starts looking at what's going on around him, right? And then he begins to sink. And the thing that the Lord put in my spirit is this, the thing that I think is really important for us to, to think about today is the reason why Peter began to sink is because he started, stopped looking at what was happening in this present moment. When we take our eyes of what's go, what's what's going on off of what's going on in this present moment if we miss the power of the now and start looking at the possibilities of what may or may not happen we begin to lose our faith and we begin to sink on the very ground that we're standing on i mean it could grasp that idea for me this this is what i've been thinking about this week i just was peter was standing on water Peter was standing on water, and instead of appreciating the moment he was in right now, he started looking at everything else going on around him. And if he only would have stayed attentive to what was going on right now and realized, holy smokes, I'm standing on water. All this other stuff is going on, but right here, right now, I am with Jesus on the water. What's going on? Now, what's going on on the water? We know from Scripture that there's a storm going on. There's, he was with, listen, picture, I mean, just go there, just paint the little postcard picture in your mind. He's standing on the sea in a storm with Jesus. And instead of paying attention to right here, right now, I am standing. I mean, there's lots going on here. I am on the water with Jesus, and all this is going on around us. And the second we take our eyes off that and begin to look at any, everything other than right here, right now, we begin to sink. And I do believe with all of my heart that is one of the key strategies that we need to be thinking about in this time in the season as we're navigating through the difficulty, navigating through how we're handling and and responses and all that. We don't need to be worrying about that. We need to be thinking about, I am standing on the water right now. I am already in a supernatural place. I am already in a completely protected place. I am already standing here with Jesus in a supernatural position. Why would I think about any other moment in time than this here right now? Because this here right now is where it's all at. Everything I've ever thought about, everything I've ever dreamed about, I'm living in supernatural life with my Jesus, with my King right here, right now. And if I start to get the Peter syndrome and start looking around me, then I begin to lose focus on what's really going on. And this is so important for us to understand. That I believe, you know, this, is, this, is, this strategy is absolutely central to us being successful in this day because we are called to recognize where we are and then bring everybody with us. And, and I, Scripture doesn't say this or anything like that, but, I mean, I got to think that Jesus was maybe hoping some of the other guys would get out too, you know, and think what's going on here and stuff like that. And there's, this is the point, this is the point of, of our existence here is to get us to focus on what's going on and then stand side by side with all of our brothers and sisters. Because, again, it is a body function. It's a body role. It's a body mentality. And Jesus has always been about his body. He has always been about his church. He has always been about building and establishing his church. The building is a, one of the consistent metaphors throughout the whole throughout Scripture, both Old and New Testament, of the church. And we have been, again, multiple testimonies in Scriptures about us as the stones in that wall, in that building. We are the ones that he is building together to stand. And then when the winds come and the waves come, depending on where you're built, you know what's going to happen, right? Listen, Scripture never says the winds and the rains aren't going to come. 
There's several, meta- several different metaphors in scriptures of floods coming through parables. You know, build your house on the sand. When what comes? When the wind and the rain comes. The Noah's flood. The enemy, Isaiah's prophecy. Listen, there is, there is consistent language in the Bible about, listen, the enemy wants to knock you off your feet. That's his goal. He wants to come in like a flood and sweep you away. That's his intention. That's his only strategy because he has to catch us by surprise because he knows when the body of Christ is standing arm in arm, alert and ready, he can do nothing. He has no power. He has no authority when we are on guard. And we have to alert our spirits. This is, that's what I'm saying. I think this is a time and a season where I think we're being challenged and we've heard so much. Oh, it's supernatural to sleep in the storm, and it is. And he wants to have peace. But there are also times and seasons where we have to stand and speak to the storm. And I believe this is one of those times. And we need to do it together. We need to do it together. There is a tremendous amount of power. There's a tremendous amount of authority. There's a tremendous amount of favor when the body of Christ begins to stand arm in arm. And I'm not just talking about people here in this house. Of course I am. But the body of Christ at large. There is anybody and everybody who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is alert right now. They are being stirred in their spirits. They're being awakened in their spirits because they recognize this isn't like it has been before. There is something different. Now, yes, there ha- we've, the nation has gone through many things, but in my generation, in different generations, this is that time where we need to stand up and recognize, listen, we need to do this. We need to set a defense. We need to be those who are declaring the word of the Lord. See, the awesome thing about the Lord is that he, he thrives on reversing the role, flipping the role. I mean, that's what he does. He is the great role reverser. And I think it's important for us to remember. So I'm, I'm announcing to some and reminding others this morning that God is a God who loves to reverse the role. He loves to take the drown, downtrodden and lift them up. He loves to take those who people think are down and out and lift them up. He brings down kingdoms. Doesn't the scripture say he is the one? Isn't he the one? You know, he makes the way, he brings up the valley. Right? He makes our way straight. Everything, the Lord delights in confounding people who think they know. He delights in confounding people who think they know. And and there would be nothing more confounding to the powers that be and to the intellectual uh, powers that be than the church of Jesus Christ standing up and changing this game. And changing this game. And I'm just naive enough to believe that we can actually do it. I'm naive enough to believe I've been taught my whole life and I, 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 I'm in this game. I'm in, I've got a dog in this fight because I believe my God is the God. I believe my king is the king. I believe my Lord is the Lord. He is the Lord of lords. He is the king of kings. There might be other lords and there might be other kings, but he is the Lord of lords. He is the king of kings. And every single knee will bow, whether you believe or don't believe, whether you're an atheist, whether you're a Gnostic, whether you're, it doesn't matter what you are, every single knee will bow at the name of Jesus Christ. And it is us. We are the privileged ones. We are the, lo- we are the chosen ones who get to hasten and hasten that day. Amen? John 10, you can jump over to, we know John 10, 10. We know this scripture. It's a powerful scripture. It's one of my, one of my favorite scriptures. I remember just growing up hearing Pastor George preach on John 10 and the sheep and the shepherd and his voice and and all. I mean, this was, this was, this was my formative years, and, and this has been something that has always been a go-to for me. And I think it's really important for us to understand that the thief comes to rob, kill, and destroy. That's his role. That's his job. He does those three things. He will rob you at every opportunity he can take. He will try to rob you. And it doesn't just mean rob you of your possessions, by the way. He will rob you of anything he can take. Emotionally, spiritually, physically, any possible thing that he thinks he can get from you, he will take from you. Well-being, confidence, self-esteem, emotional, anything, and your stuff too. He will try to take it. 
He will, and he will try to kill you. This, this word kill here is very interesting because it's speaking specifically to believers. He will try to kill believers, and he will try to destroy those who aren't believers from becoming believers. He will try to annihilate their life. He thinks he has a plan for everything and everyone. But as we know, when the Lord shows up, he will scatter. His plan is thwarted. Amen. But he comes, and, he, and what this means is he is searching for some to rob, kill, steal, and destroy from. He's going around looking. We know that he's, he's roaming around as a lion, you know, trying to kill, steal, and destroy. And he's, he's going to this. And what, he's, and what I think we're seeing right now that we haven't seen in a while maybe is we're actively becoming aware of the fact of the enemy walking around out there just trying to destroy people. He's actually walking around trying to destroy people, destroy the way they think, the way they put two and two together. They're, he's, just trying to, he's just trying to totally confuse and, and, and just uh, frustrate their minds. And getting, I mean, it's so nonsensical. It's so, when you look through the eyes of the Spirit and you see what's going on, I mean, of course, we, it's clear. But it, it's just what they're thinking and how they're drawing their conclusions and, and then the solutions they're coming up with to these Incorrect conclusions in the first. It's just like, really? I don't even know how that can happen. That's ex- what we are observing is the enemy robbing, killing, and destroying. That's exactly what we're observing taking place here. But Messiah has come, right? What do we know? What's later on? We read down here in John 10. He has come to give us life and life more abundantly. He has come to give us the solutions and the answers. That's living a, a full, complete, whole life. A full, complete, whole life means not having anything robbed from us, not having anything stolen from us, not having everything destroyed in our lives, because he intends for us to walk in that kind of victory. So the only place of legitimate peace is in the kingdom of God, right? And the kingdom of God we know is in the Holy Spirit. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And it is that peace, you know, we know that it's unspeakable. It's an unreasonable peace. Peace that doesn't make sense. And that's exactly what we're experiencing. When we actually live our life, when we actually live our life the way that God intended us to live our life, what's it look like? It looks pretty unreasonable, does it not? When we have peace that passes understanding, the outside world looks at us and they begin to panic because we're not panicking. They begin to get anxious because we're not anxious. They be, what, what's wrong with those people? And that's kind of what we're observing and kind of what we're seeing here. And, and you know, let's, I'll skip some stuff here and we'll see if we get back to it. But this is exactly God's M.O., by the way. Jump to Jeremiah 29 with me. We're going to skip over some stuff. I'm, I know you can track with me here. Sorry, I'm jumping around. But jump, jump over to Jeremiah chapter 29. I know the guys in the back took down my scripture notes, and they're not in order, so sorry about that. So, you know, we know this Jeremiah 29, 11 part, right? We, we, we quote this all the time, and this is an incredibly powerful statement. But I, I wonder if we are aware of the context of what's going on here. The Lord tells through the prophet Jeremiah, okay, there's another prophecy. He says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And we know that. And this has been one of the cornerstones of my own life. But I wonder if we've ever looked at the context of this scripture before. So let's jump up to chapter, or same chapter, 29, but first, we'll start in verse, five, uh, verse 4. Okay, so this is what's going on. So this prophecy or this declaration is given by the prophet Jeremiah in the midst of Israel's captivity. Do you realize that this prophetic declaration came to Israel during their captivity? When everything was bad. When everything wasn't looking so good. Let's read this. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. So this is when this is going on. So he's speaking to this people who have been captivated, who have been, who have been held captive, okay, as a consequence of their sin. But this is what the Lord tells them to do 
in the midst of this circumstance, in the midst of this chaos, in the midst of this what's going on. He's verse 5, he says. Go ahead and jump out to verse 5. He says, this is what I want you to do in the midst of your captivity. Build houses. Dwell in them. Plant gardens. Eat their fruit. Take wives. Beget sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and daughters so that they may bear sons and daughters that you may be increased and not be diminished. Not be diminished. Verse 7, And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive. And pray to the Lord for, in, for it. For in its peace you will have peace. Keep reading. Verse 10. Let's jump to verse 10, sorry. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return from that place. For, and this is now there where we always get to. For I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a hope and an expected end or a future. What's interesting is we fail sometimes to recognize what's exactly going on when we read this scripture. Jeremiah 29, 11. We realize now that what's going on is Israel itself, the church, the body of Christ, the people of God, are being attacked. They are being carried away into captivity from what they see. And the Lord says, in the midst of this, this is what I want you to do. Keep the peace. Okay? Build houses. Enjoy your families. Take wives. Have children. Have, enjoy your families. Listen, live life. And I will summarize it and get to the the body. If you summarize all that, I said, listen, in the midst of this, live life. Enjoy life what you can and while you can. And know this, because I have a promise for you. Because after this is all over, I thought good thoughts about you all along. I will bring you back to the place that you left in the first place. And this is really important for us to get, because I know a lot of believers out there who don't know what to do. They just don't know what to do. They, they want to hope in God. They want to believe in God. And, and, they, and they have a good testimony. And they're doing their best game of testimony. But, they, but, but then they like, but what do I really do? You know, I know the Lord's going to provide, but what do I do? I know the Lord's going to break through, but what do I do? I know, well, live in your house. Pay your bills. Go to work. Enjoy your family. Assemble together, like Hebrews tells us. Assemble together. Forsake not the assembling together of yourselves. Come together, recognize that when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord is going to set up a standard. And we can do all this. We don't need to be scared. We don't need to be afraid. We don't need to be frightened. Scripture is very clear. Amen? Can I get an amen? amen. There are things with you. What you do, you just go on living your life with a new sense of urgency, but also understanding what's going on. Not being deceived, not being fooled, and understand that the enemy is out there trying to rob, kill, steal, and destroy. But we don't have to worry because the standard has been set. Jesus, as our king, he has spoken to the storm. The end has been declared. He knows the end. Jeremiah also says he knows the end from the beginning. There's nothing that he hasn't seen. There's nothing he doesn't recognize. There's nothing that hasn't surprised him. And Solomon tells us another thing, that there is nothing new under the sun. There is nothing new under the sun. We've heard it here for a couple weeks in a row now, and it's absolutely true. Several weeks ago, uh, my wife, we like to walk, so we take a lot of long walks every day. And uh, we were talking a couple weeks ago, and I said, you know what? I remember, of course, I wasn't around, but I remember reading in school, in the history books and all that kind of stuff, about how other generations thought that, this was, this was it, you know, the, the, civil, the civil rights movement. And, and I've read about Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King, you know, and, and, and how he handled the situation and things he did and, and reading about what was going on in the Deep South and all those kinds of things and the racial tensions. This, racial tensions is not new. Racial tensions is not new. And it's not unique to this country by a long shot. When we lived in Africa, you know, we visited some places uh, down in, in Cape Town where, they, were, where um, they would be selling slaves to India. And they just went and, all, and we learned about Livingston and how Livingston helped in the slave trade in South Africa. Or I'm not in, Cape, not in uh, South Africa, sorry, in, in Tanzania. And, and that, how, how critical 
uh, that was. And that's not, this, this is not new to this nation. It's not new to the planet. The tensions and the strifes that we're feeling. Listen, there were wars and rumors of wars for a long time. World War I, World War, the, the Great War, the war to end all wars. There wasn't going to be another one. This was going to be, I mean, think about There's other generations who I absolutely know because they have written things and they pass on who thought this was it too. This is nothing new. And Solomon tells us, listen, there's nothing new under the sun. This too will come to an end. This too shall pass. And I think it's important that we understand that to help us with perspective. Does that mean that we lower our guard? Does that mean that, okay, well, maybe we can sleep in the bow of the boat? No, we still, we have a sense. Every generation has, a, has something that they need to stand and fight for. And I believe with all of my heart, this could be it for us. We need to stand and make a declaration that Jesus Christ is King of kings. Jesus Christ is Lord of lords. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what he did then, he will do now. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Did you hear me? He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yesterday, today, and forever. He is the same. He does not falter. He does not change. He does not move. He intended yesterday for the gates of hell not to prevail. He intends today for the gates of hell not to prevail. And he intends for forever the gates of hell not to prevail. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. The question is, are we in the church? Are we in the boat? Are we in the building? Are we tied in? I got some amens. We need to begin to think about and realize, listen, this is beyond me. This is beyond me. This is beyond us. This is be we can only do this together. There is a time and a season for the body of Christ. And I believe that we're beginning to sense it. We're beginning to see it. And there's something, and I'm not talking about unity and citywide churches or anything like that. I'm not, I don't mean that in any way, shape, or form. Because everybody's got a position. Everybody's set. The scripture talks about, you know, we're ramparts on the wall. And we all have our place and position on the wall. But it's time to set ourselves up. It's time to be there. And we've been doing this all along. But now it's time. It's like what we've been hearing and praying and reading about. Maybe it's time for the church to be that powerful force. You know, the metaphor that's gone out, you know, it's been for ages is the church is the sleeping giant. And the sleeping giant's going to wake up. Okay, well, let's wake up. Let's wake up. Because we are the giant. We are the ones. We are the ones that God has chosen. Are we not? We are the ones that God has chosen to make a difference on the planet. We are the ones. That's my just, I got canceled. Stop. There we go. We are the ones God has chosen. It's like Esther in Israel. Mordecai, who, can, who some say is kind of a, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Ask Esther the question. Maybe you're here for such a time as this. It's the Holy Spirit the, as, as maybe beginning to ask us the question. And part of that, it we're becoming aware of that, because that can be a scary question. Why are you here? Why are you here? Why are you here? The world needs us. The world needs us. The system needs us. Industry needs Every place needs us. Every place needs us. And they need the Christ that's in us. You know, there's a, there's a day when, well, all right, well, we need good, we need, we need faithful, good workers, and we need all that, and we do need all that. But we also need to recognize greater is he who is in me than he that is in the world. And I need to live my life out there like I believe that. Greater is he who is in me than he that is in the world. Greater is he who is in me than he that is in the world. Ooh. Greater is he who is in me than he that is in the world. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Do we believe that? Do we believe that? Because this is what makes us different. This is what makes us unique. Being led away into captivity and the world falling apart. But you know what? I'm going to live my life. I'm going to do what I do. And I'm going to gather with my brothers and sisters. And we are going to make the difference that the world needs to see. We are going to be the ones. And we can only do that in the Holy Ghost. Because we can't do it any other way. We're not smart enough. We're not wise enough. We haven't lived long enough. The Holy Spirit has been here from the beginning. The Holy Spirit sees all things, knows all things, comprehends all things, leads and guides us into all truth. 
We must, we must, we must be led and directed by the Holy Spirit. It's time to tune our ears to hear what the Spirit says. It's time to tune our eyes to see what the Spirit sees. It's time to begin to hone our gifts, to hone our skills, to hone our abilities, and begin to tune in and recognize, Lord, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to respond? How do you want me to live? This is what Paul's been talking about. When they come, have an answer. Ready. Be ready in season. Be ready out of season. That's just how you're ready out of season. Well, you're not because you're not. It's a supernatural presence comes upon you. And in a supernatural moment, you open your mouth. And what? The words, the Holy Spirit will fill it. These are the days. This is the days that are upon us. I believe that. And I believe this fight. You know, Scripture is clear. We are battling not against flesh and blood. And we, this is it. I mean, this is why the Scriptures are here for us to warn us and to tell us about these things. The scripture is clear to us. Listen, your battle is not against flesh and blood. This is not a Democrat. This is not a Republican. This is not a black lives thing. This is not flesh and blood. This is a spirit. These are principalities and powers that are recognizing a weak moment and they're trying to rob, kill, steal, and destroy. And they're doing it like gangbusters. And the Lord has prophesied in advance when he does that, I will set up a standard, and it's not going and, and to be effective. I will set up a standard against them. I will set up a standard against them, and we need to recognize that. You know, this, this, this notion in, in Ephesians is also one of incredibly powerful notions. I'm, I'm done. I'm closing up. But I want to just give you a couple of thoughts here. Ephesians 3.10. And I know last, I preached a few weeks ago. I think it was a few weeks ago. And, uh, and we talked about Ephesians 3.10. But I want to remind us about this portion of Scripture because this is a powerful Scripture. And it helps us put perspective of actually what's going on. Because, again, I think sometimes one of the things that the enemy allows us to do is to begin to believe that this is about somebody or some group or some organization. And it's not. Our battle is not against flesh and blood but principalities and powers in heavenly places. Ephesians 3.10 tells us exactly what the church is supposed to do with those principalities and powers in heavenly places. And it says, to the intent now that the manifold wisdom of God, that literally means the diversity of God, which is ironic. The many-faceted wisdom, the diversity of God. And I, I remember I gave the metaphor of, of the, this is a perfect metaphor of a prism. And when the light shines in the prism, the prism refracts all the lights and you get all the colors of the rainbow that come out of that. And that's what the church is to do. When the Holy Spirit shines through the church, you get the diversity and the manifestation of God. You get, you get God's diverse manifestations in all the different things that he intended from the body of Christ. But we have to have this light of the Spirit shining through the church to express the diversity of God, and what has happened to that? The diversity of God is made known to the principalities and powers in heavenly places, and they can't do anything about it because that's our role. That's our function. That's our calling. Our calling is the body of Christ. When we come together, when we come together and we allow the Holy Spirit to shine through us, God's diversity is expressed on the earth, and the enemy is confounded. The principalities and powers have no retort. Jordy, you can come. Musicians can come. The world is trying to tell us that we are alone. The world is trying to tell us that we are separate. You know, Psalm 68, last week when, at, when Pastor George was doing ministry time after the service, I was just worshiping in my spot. And remember, he asked us to go out and pray for individual people, and start doing a little bit more body ministry. The Lord dropped in my spirit, Psalm 68, verse 6, where he says, he says the solitary in families. You know that? I want to encourage you this morning with that. The Lord sets solitary in families. What's the solitary? Solitude. The Lord sets those who think they're alone. The Lord sets those who are isolated, who are disenfranchised, who are out there by themselves. He takes those who are solitary, those who think they don't belong, those who think they can't contribute, those who think they have nothing to add. Listen, every single one of us 
has something to contribute and something to add. And that might be one of the things that the enemy is trying to rob from you. The belief and the conviction that you have something to add. You have some value to give. You have something that you're needed here for. Do not let the enemy tell you that you don't have anything to contribute. That's why you're here. He takes those of us who think that way and he puts us in families. This is a family. This is why you're here because in this place, in this house, if you want to do any good thing, just ask and we'll do our best to make sure that you have an opportunity to use the gifts that God has given you to use. We'll do everything that we know to do to give you an opportunity to express the, the vision that the Lord has put in your heart and the purpose and the goals and the talents and the gifts that he's given you. We would be, we would be unwise stewards if we didn't. And this is a place he sets us in solitary. He takes us solitary and sets us in families just for this. And this is the time where we need to come together as a family, as a family together, understanding and recognizing that we all have something to contribute. And then when we all use the gifts that God has given us, we can see the change on the earth that we need to see. But it starts, I mean, yes, one person makes, I mean, one of us coming together, this whole thing, all these movements, all these changes start somewhere. Why can't it start with Foundation Stone Church in Northwood, Ohio? A bunch of radical, crazy, silly Christians who actually think their God listens to them, who actually think that their God stands beside them, who actually thinks their God will walk with them in the midst of the storm and supernatural power. Do we believe that or do we not believe that? If you believe that, stand up with me this morning. This is something that we need to confess. This is something that we need to declare. Jesus Christ is alive and well. He is not buried. He is not in a tomb. He is not on a cross. He is alive and well. He is walking. He is moving. He is living. He is speaking. He is declaring. He is fighting. He is interceding for us. He wants to see us move. There is a great cloud of witnesses out there right now who are cheering for us, who are rooting for us, who are praying for us to accomplish and to see what they've seen and what they've been praying for, hoping for their entire existences. So, Father, we come before you, Father, as a body of Christ, as people, Father, who, do, who love you and who adore you, Father. We come before you today. Father, we ask, Father, that you would give us wisdom and discernment. We ask you would give us power and authority. Father, we need power and authority. Father, we need power. We need power, Lord, such as we've never seen before, such as we've never lived before. It's time, Father, stir up the gifts. Stir up our hearts, Lord God. Stir up our hearts. Stir up our spirits. Awaken us, O oh Lord God. Awaken our hearts. Pray in the Spirit. Just pray in the Spirit out loud. You are the God of revival. Father, you are King of kings and Lord of lords. Stir us up, Lord God. Father, we need to see the supernatural manifest in the body of Christ. Father, it's time. Father, we are crying out. Father, we are crying out. We are crying out for supernatural manifestations of the Holy Spirit. For supernatural manifestation of the sons of God, Father. You said that you would pour out your spirit in the last days on all flesh. And that your sons and daughters would prophesy and old men would dream dreams to see visions. Lord our Father, we ask, restore the dreams. Give the dreams. Give the visions. Restore the prophets, Lord God. Father, we need the apostles and the prophets and the teachers, the pastors, the evangelists to be loose and on the earth again, Lord God. Father, cause a revival in our hearts. Cause a revival in our community. Cause a revival around us, Lord God. So, Father, we pray and bless in Jesus' name. Father, we declare you are King of kings and you are Lord of lords. You are the first and the last. You are the Alpha and the Omega. You are the beginning and the end. You are the cornerstone and you are the capstone. Father, there is, you are in everything in between, Lord God. You are from A to Z, everything that we've needed. So Father, we confess our dependence upon you. We confess our reliance upon you. There is nothing that we can do and no value that we can add. But you, oh Lord God, 
You are complete. You are full. You are mature. You are perfect in every way. So, Father, may your words be in our hearts. May your words be in our mouth. May your presence be in our every step. Father, we ask in Jesus' name for the power of the Holy Spirit to begin to move, to begin to shake, to begin to rattle our lives. Father, the old and the young, the old and the young. Father, we can, like David said, we can leap through or leap over a wall and run through the truth, Lord God. Father, we pray in Jesus' name for your power to come. If you don't mind, I'd like everybody just to hold hands with your groups there. of God. We are called to live life together. We are called to stand side by side with each other, supporting and encouraging and loving, carrying each other's burdens, Scripture says. Am I my brother's keeper? Am I my brother's keeper? I hear the Holy Spirit asking, asking us, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. So, Father, we stand together hand in hand, arm in arm, as a testimony, Father, as a stance to say that we are family and that we are part of the body of Christ. We want to be counted in your family, O oh Lord. So, Father, I pray in Jesus' name that every person in this room, that every person who calls on the name of the Lord on this planet, the name of Jesus Christ, this planet, Father, would be united together and that we would stand arm in arm as soldiers, as an army led by the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Father, I ask a blessing on every single person here. I ask a blessing on our families, Father. The, the blessing of Deuteronomy 28, Father, I declare in Jesus' name. And Father, we declare that when the enemy comes in one way, to our house and to our family, to our community. He will flee seven ways in the name of Jesus. And we say to the storm, be still in the name of Jesus. I want you to just pray with the person next to you, if you won't mind, just for a moment. As the worship team sings, I just feel like the Lord wants us to just lift up his name together as a family. So with your people next to you, whoever's hand you're holding, if you would just, get, you just pray, just however you want, just pray to the Lord and honor and bring glory to the King of Kings. In the struggle the crumble, I hear the chains hit the ground. God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Come awaken your people. Come awake in the city, oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Every struggle will crumble, I hear the chains hit the ground, but God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Come awake in your people. Come awake in the city, God of revival, pour 